Come here, Gen Z. Your millennial auntie has a story for you. Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and thanks to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. I am a self-taught sewist and I recreate historical garments that I see in museums and in portraits entirely by hand. I do not own a sewing machine, I don't want a sewing machine, I don't like using sewing machines, and if you would like to see a video on why, then drop me a comment below and I can definitely do that for you at some point. On this channel, we will be talking about fashion history, modern fashion, we'll be doing some sewing tutorials, some video essays, so if that's the kind of content that you are interested in, then hit that notification bell, smash that subscribe button, like this video, do all of those YouTube things so that I can keep serving you the yummy, yummy content that you wanna see. This is my first ever YouTube video, so please be kind to me and to each other in the comments. I don't wanna see any hate or negativity. We are all just learning here. So without further ado, if you were a kid in the early 2000s, then you probably remember this and this. But did you know that before there was CGI Barbie, there was this? Oh yeah, Barbie and the Rockers. Barbie and the Rockers was an animated film that came out in 1987, and I was a little girl in the early 1990s, long before Barbie and the Nutcracker first came out. So this was all I had in terms of Barbie movies, and I was obsessed with this movie, like obsessed. Every weekend, my parents would take me down to the video store that was near our house. This was like when you had to go to the physical video store and pick out like a physical VHS tape, and then you had to bring it back to your house, and then you had to plug it into your VCR player, and then you had to watch it, and then you had to rewind it, and then you had to bring it back to the store, and it was just like, this was life before Netflix, what can I say? That's a good story, Grandpa. Anyway, so I was so obsessed with this movie. Every Saturday, without fail, well, okay, except for this one Saturday where someone else got to it first, and like, all that was left was this like crappy Little Mermaid animated knockoff thing so I had to watch that instead and it was, just, it was sad. Anyways so every Saturday I would watch this video and it was my favorite thing in the world and there's this one scene in it where Barbie comes swanning down the stairs in this beautiful poofy baby pink ball gown and it just blew my little five-year-old brains out. And all I could think about like ever was this dress and I would put on my dad's old t-shirts and spin around my room and pretend that I was Barbie at the outer space ball with Ken. I think you've just made another conquest, Barbie. And for the three of you who got that reference, thank you, you to real MVPs. For the rest of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, someone here on the YouTubes has kindly uploaded the entire Barbie and the Rockers video. I have a link to in the description below, so if you want to go check it out, I highly recommend that you do so because it's amazing. Anyway, so I was obsessed with this dress. I just wanted to wear this dress more than anything in the world. And now that I'm a grown ass woman, I have decided that it is high time I make this dress for myself. So it is my birthday coming up in about a month. So I've decided that I'm going to draft the pattern and I'm gonna sew this dress out of some silk taffeta that I have in my stash. And I'm gonna do it all by hand as I always do. And uh, we're gonna see how this turns out. So if you wanna see me recreate my dream dress, then let's get started. I'll only say one thing. It's going to be out of this world. So looking at these crappy screenshots that I printed off from YouTube will give us a little bit of an idea of what the dress looks like in terms of its basic construction. So it appears that we have a halter neck here and a little bit of a tank top and then we've got a waistband and the skirt looks like it's pleated into the waistband. It could be gathered but I'm going to go with pleats here 
just because that's what it looks like from this little cartoon and also the fact that I'm using silk taffeta means that pleats would be better silk taffeta is a little bit stiffer if I was using a softer material like a cotton voile or a linen then I might do gathers but because the silk taffeta is really starchy and holds its shape well I think pleats would work better so we're gonna go with that oh hi bonsai hi bonsai it's our after dinner snuggles so yeah, pleated skirt it is. Also, if you look at the neckline here, it seems to be a halter neck. Now, I think what I'm gonna do here is modify this neckline a little bit and have a neck band that attaches at the back, kind of like what you see on old Edwardian blouses. I'm gonna do that here just because, again, my silk taffeta is a little bit stiffer and it's going to just help it keep its shape a little more, I suspect, but these are all decisions we will make further in the mock-up stage. Also, it looks here like her top is a little bit drapey, like it kind of blouses out over the waistband a little bit. Mine will not do that because of the silk taffeta. Again, if I was using like a cotton or a linen or something a little bit softer, I might be able to get that effect, but just the nature of my fabric is not going to behave that way so I'm gonna try to have like as fitted of a bodice as I possibly can which means I probably will also have to add some darts here but again we'll see in the mock-up stage we'll make those decisions so yeah so you can see that the dress is floor length obviously but other than that it's a pretty simple shape oh yeah we've got an open back here so this is going to mean that the back will have to attach at the waist, so maybe with either a small zipper or a hook and eye closures, I haven't decided yet. That also just gives me a little bit more ammo for my neckline theory that I'm definitely gonna want a neckband here because it's going to attach itself around the back of my neck, which is just gonna give me another anchor for that bow. It's gonna be a little bit different, won't be exactly the same as this dress just because of the nature of the fabric I'm using and also my dress will not be a cartoon. So there is that, um, but yeah, we're gonna hopefully make something as close to this as we possibly can. So now that I have a basic idea of what the dress looks like and the shapes I need, I'm gonna go ahead and start drafting my pattern. But the first step in drafting any pattern is to make sure that you have a steaming hot cup of your favorite tea and some homemade cookies for sustenance. Well, I am a firm believer that the best predictor of future patterns is past patterns, so I am going to use this dress to help me draft my pattern for the new dress. I am using this one because it's a similar shape to the one that I want to make with the open back and the halter neckline. If this makes absolutely no sense, don't worry about it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. I'm just kind of feeling this out as I go. So. This is not a tutorial, this is more of a process video, I cannot stress that enough. If you follow this the way I'm doing it, you will probably screw up, so just enjoy the ride, that's what I'm doing. Anyways, I wanna measure from here to here because that's gonna give me the length of the bodice, and then I'm gonna measure from like outer boob cup to outer boob cup, and that's gonna give me the width of the bodice. And then I'm gonna take this measurement here, which is my waistline, but I'm gonna measure that on my actual body. And then I'm going to measure the circumference of my neck because on the new pattern, it's going to pleat down into the neckline at the top. So we're gonna to have to draft like a separate piece to go around the neck here and a separate waistband. I'm not gonna bother drafting patterns for those because they're just rectangles, so I don't see the need in like wasting paper to draw out rectangles, but if you wanna do that, go right ahead. You do you, I'm not stopping you. So let's go ahead and take these measurements. Okay, so I've taken all those measurements and what I'm gonna do now is transfer them onto this tissue paper. Um, disclaimer, I don't like using this tissue paper. It's really, really thin. It's like that thin wrapping paper stuff that you put in gift bags. And I don't like using it because the second I like touch it with a pen, it just pokes a million holes in it. So I prefer using wrapping paper because it's just a lot sturdier, but I don't have any wrapping paper on me at the moment. So this is gonna have to do. So what we're gonna do is draw out like 
a rough trapezoidal shape which is going to be the front of the bodice we don't have to draft anything for the back because the back is open so it's basically just going to be this like piece that gets sewn into the neckline and the waistline and that's all so it should be fairly straightforward i say this now we'll see what actually happens so we're gonna go ahead and draft this Okay, so I've gone ahead and traced over that draft with Sharpie pen, which I normally would not do, but I realized that you can like barely see the pen that I used on camera. So this is going to be the shape of the top or the front of the bodice. I went ahead and extended these lines out so that it can have something to like pleat into the waistband. I have a feeling that I'm going to have to move this line up a little bit, but these are little corrections that we will discover and make in the mock-up stage. I also marked out the halfway point on this 18 inch line. So this is where the bodice is the widest. And so I went when I went to draft like the other side, I used this as a marker for where I should draft the line for 11 inches. That didn't make any sense, but you'll see when we start actually doing it. Um, okay, and then this is the top. This is gonna get sewn down into the neckline and this is gonna get sewn into the waistband. So we're gonna go ahead and cut this out and do a mock-up and uh, we'll see in the mock-up stage just how many adjustments need to be made. Hi, editing Megan here. I just wanted to clarify that I did not film the mock-up process because I don't see the point because I literally just slapped the pattern down on some old fabric and then cut out the mock-up, basted it together and checked the fit. I know some people like to spend a lot of time on their mock-ups, but I don't ever do that just because ain't got time for that. So I don't bother with like super detailed, almost perfect wearable mock-ups. I don't bother with that shit. I literally just like throw it together. Sometimes I even pin based my mock-ups just to check how it fits because that's the point of a mock-up. If you want to go do a super detailed wearable mock-up, like I'm not going to stop you. You do you, boo. That's on you guys. I just don't do it. So you will never see picture perfect mock-ups on this channel. Just FYI. Okay. All right. Back to the regularly scheduled content. So I've cut out my pattern and just holding it up to my body, I can already tell that it's going to need some adjustments like before I even get to the mock-up stage. So I'm going to have to draft a curve into the neckband here just because it's going to wrinkle if I try to attach it to a neckband the way that it is. So this is going to have to have a curve. Also, it's a little too long, so I'm going to have to cut off about four or five inches at the bottom here because my waist is actually here and I want this to stop at the waist. So I'm going to have to cut off the pattern here. I also want to add a little bit more width just like at the side right here. So we're going to add that in, just draft that shape. And also it's going to need a dart because I'm not using stretchy fabric. My silk taffeta is has like no give whatsoever. So I'm gonna have to add just a couple of little darts in here to account for the fact that I have boobs, however small they are, they do still exist and they will require some darts. So we're gonna go ahead and fix up this pattern and then we're gonna try it again and then we're gonna do the mock-up and see if any further adjustments are needed. So let's go. All right, so I've gone ahead and fixed up that first draft of the pattern and this is more what it looks like. So I've just extended the sides a bit. I've made it a bit wider here. I've added the um, little dip thing to the neckline and I've added in the darts. So just for reference, this is what it looked like before. So before it was just literally a trapezoid and now it just has a little more nuance to it. This is what it looks like after. So this is the pattern that I'm gonna go ahead and cut out and I'm gonna do my mock-up with this. So this whole exercise just goes to show that if you are afraid of pattern drafting because you're a perfectionist, you shouldn't be because it never works out on the first draft, like never. Literally the first time that you draft a pattern is just to get the basic shape and then you work out the specifics and the details of that shape in the mock-up stage and that's when you make all your corrections and that's when you perfect it. When you actually go to draw the pattern, it's like almost never perfect on the first try and if it is, you're a genius and you need to call me like right now and tell me your secret because it's always, always, always going to be crap the first time you try it. So 
that's why you keep going that's why we do mock-ups this is why we do all of this prep work before we go and move on to our final very expensive fabric so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out and do the mock-up try on the mock-up and see how that works and if any further adjustments are needed okay it's not bad but as is always the case with my mock-ups one side turned out better than the other side so this is going to be the side that I use in my final pattern and we have a little bit of a gape here but I didn't actually pleat this into the neckline so I think either by pleating or gathering the top here into the neckline that's going to fix that that gape at the side so I'm not too worried about that however there is a little bit of fabric missing here so I think I'm going to extend this line maybe another inch outwards like that just so that it covers like this part of my boob because as you can see I've got a bit of the side boob going on and well I'm not entirely comfortable with that so we're gonna fix that and other than that I'm pretty happy with it so just a couple of minor adjustments. Um, this time when I put it together, I'm gonna try gathering this into the neckline to see if that fixes this issue here. If not, we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board, but hey, this is why we make mock-ups. All right, so I've gone ahead and taken apart the mock-up and I've retraced it on my paper. I added two inches to the sides here and I also straightened out the neckline at the top. I realized that if I'm gonna gather this into the neckband, it's easier to just have a straight line versus like having that curve. So I just redrafted it as the straight line. I also cut it in half because for some reason, whenever I do mock-ups, one side always turns out better than the other side. I don't know how or why that happens. Me, no, no. You'd think that both sides would be symmetrical, but I guess it's just human error in pattern drafting. You can't always like, account for that so I just cut it in half I took the side that turned out better and what I'm gonna do is then flip this over retrace it so that I have the full front and then I'm going to cut that out and do mock-up number two so let's get on it okay I think we are ready to rock and roll here I am happy with this mock-up I'm happy that it only took two mock-ups I'm happy with the gathers. I wasn't too neat and tidy with them because it's just a mock-up, so I didn't like try to carefully gather this. I just kind of shoved it into the neckband. So when I move on to my actual fabric, I will make sure that these gathers are neat and tidy and that they sit nicely. But I just needed to know that the idea worked and it does, so that's good. I added more fabric here. I'm much happier with the amount that is here. It's not like cutting me off mid boobs, so that's good. Um, I'm happy with the fit, I'm happy with the darts, I'm happy with both sides, and I think it's ready to go. I think we can safely move on to our fashion fabric here, now that you all have a shot of my belly button and my dog on the floor. So yeah, let's go and cut out some silk. I did something really stupid. So I accidentally cut this one skirt panel on the wrong grain line, which is not a huge deal. I can fix it later, but essentially it just means that it's not long enough. Hey, that's what she said. So what I did was I cut it this way. So like this is the length here, you can see. And I was supposed to cut it this way because this is the width of the fabric and my fabric is 54 inches wide and I need my skirt panel to be 54 inches wide. This is like maybe 45 inches. So if I had left the skirt panel like this, it's going to be not full enough. So I'm gonna have one skirt panel that's 54 inches wide and one that's about 45 inches wide and that's not good. So what I should have done was cut it this way from salvage to salvage. This is not a huge deal because I'm just gonna use this panel and cut out the bodice and the waistband and the neckband from it. And I still have more fabric left over enough to make a skirt panel that is the proper width and length. So it's not a big deal. However, this is a lesson in why you should always buy more fabric than you think you need. Do not skimp on fabric, always buy an extra yard because cutting mistakes do happen. 
All right, now that I've got the skirt situation figured out, I'm now just tracing along the bodice pattern that I drafted. And what I've done is just pinned it to the silk and I'm using a heat erase pen to trace the lines with. And I'm doing this really carefully because if the lines are off, then the fit is also going to be off. So this is another one of those moments where you wanna be super precise. So I'm just going ahead and doing that. I'm not too worried about marking up my silk because like I said, these are heat erase pens, so it doesn't really matter. And I'm also gonna go ahead and trace up the inside of the darts because that's gonna mark the lines that I'm going to sew. So so when I go to cut this out, I'm going to cut out around these pieces and give myself plenty of seam allowance. Commercial patterns will come with a seam allowance already built into them and then you just have to adjust your sewing machine to whatever they tell you is the seam allowance. But because I'm not using a machine and because I drafted this pattern myself, I get to decide how much seam allowance I want. So just another one of the benefits of hand sewing and making your own patterns. I usually give myself a good half inch to an inch because I like to have plenty of fabric in my seams to work with, but it's really up to you how much seam allowance you wanna give your Yourself, it doesn't really matter. So now I'm just drafting out the shapes for my neckband and for the waistband, which are basically just two differently sized rectangles, which as I said earlier, I didn't bother actually drafting a pattern for because I'm just gonna draw them right on my fabric. So I'm marking them on the bias so that they'll have some stretch to them because they have to stretch around my neck and around my waist. All right, I've cut out all of my pieces and I also went ahead and cut out some lining for the bodice and the neck strap. Yes, that's right, the neck strap. The best we can do is breathe and reboot. And I've cut it out of some like really nice soft cotton voile. I don't like having silk taffeta next to my skin because silk taffeta cannot be washed because the second you wash it, all of the starch goes out and it just becomes limp and awful and I would not recommend trying it. I don't even like dry cleaning it, so I just take the course of not washing my silk taffeta at all, which means that it can't go next to my skin, which means that it needs to have lining. So I'm not too worried about the skirt because it's going to have an underskirt of some really fluffy like polyester tulle. So that's gonna be next to my skin, not the silk taffeta. So that's why I cut out those two lining pieces. Just basically anything that's gonna be next to bare skin is gonna get a lining on it because worst case scenario, you can just take the lining out and replace it if it gets really gross. So that is why I do that. I didn't bother filming cutting out the lining because it's literally the same thing as cutting out the silk taffeta. You already saw that, you don't need to see it again. We need to get started on actually sewing this. All right, let's go. So I always begin with a pillow in my lap to raise my work up to the level of my face. That way I don't strain my neck. And I also use a thimble when I sew because it helps to push the needle through the fabric. And I'm also using these tiny little 10 sharp quilting needles. They give the tiniest little stitches, which is why I love them. And for sewing, I'm using my favorite silk thread. I love silk thread for hand sewing because it goes really smoothly and it doesn't knot or twist very easily. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a fresh needle, untarnished of course, and then I'm going to thread the needle and we're ready to get started. So whenever we sew a garment with darts, the very first step is to sew up the darts. And my favorite method for that is to just first pinch the top of the dart with my thumb and my forefinger, right where the triangle ends, and then I insert a straight pin into that point where I pinch the fabric. And then I just keep pinching and pinning right along the center of the dart, inserting my pins as I go. And then you always wanna to check to make sure that your pin goes through both of the lines that you marked so that when you sew it up, you get a nice straight line without any wonky curving. It's really important to do this because if you don't get it through both lines or if you miss or if your pins are slightly off, then you're gonna end up with a garment that doesn't fit correctly. So it's really important to be extremely precise when you do this. There we go, 
now we're ready to sew. So to start, I'm going to insert the needle right into that line that I marked, and I'm going to do three back stitches to lock in my work, and then on the third back stitch, I'm going to take a small knot in my thread. The knot is optional, you don't have to do that, it's perfectly secure with three back stitches, I just prefer to do the knot for my own peace of mind, and to just make my work as secure as possible. So then once that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna back stitch all along that line that I marked. I like to use back stitches on seams that take a lot of strain, like on darts, especially bust darts, or on waist seams or on sleeves. Back stitching is the strongest stitch that you can possibly do. It's a little bit slower than some other stitches. It doesn't go quite as fast, but it's well worth the effort because it will make your work extremely durable and strong. Like the fabric will pull and break before anything ever happens to those stitches. finished seam you can see with tiny tiny stitches that are barely visible and once I iron the darts that blue line will disappear so you will barely see those stitches at all okay check this out this is why I love hand sewing guys because look at how neat and tidy this seam is usually when you do darts with a sewing machine you always get this like little loop thing here at the top because you can't really angle the fabric the right way in a sewing machine but when you hand sew you can maneuver the needle in such a way so that you get this nice seamless straight line of a dart here and look at this when i press open these seams you're not even going to be able to see them it's just going to be completely smooth like look at that look at look at how nicely that dart finishes yeah, guys, this is why I love hand sewing. It's so precise and you get such neat and tidy results compared to what you get on a machine. So yeah, don't be fooled. You do not need a sewing machine to sew, I promise. Okay, so now that the lining is prepped, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing with the silk. I'm gonna sew up the darts, but I'm not gonna film it because you've already seen it right here, so you don't need to see it again. So I'm just gonna go ahead, sew up those two darts on the silk piece. And then I'm going to press them both open, both on the lining and the silk. And then once that's done, I will put the lining and the silk together. So I will film that so that you can see it, but I'm just not gonna film the darts or the pressing because you, you've seen an iron before, you know how that works. One hour later. All right, so I just went ahead and attached the lining to the silk. I didn't actually end up filming it because it's pretty straightforward. I just put the wrong sides together and then I felled the lining down with a simple felling stitch, which, there we go, is just a very simple stitch that if you guys want, I can do a tutorial on different kinds of stitches later. I just did the whole thing. It, it was a pretty quick step. And then I also went ahead and did the same thing with the neck strap, neck band, whatever it's called. You know what this is. You know what your nickname is, Mr. Big. <laughs> the next thing that I have to do is on both of these pieces, I'm going to just finish off the edges by tucking them under. And then I'm going to do a simple felled hem like this with the same felling stitch all the way around, both the neck strap and the bodice piece. And then I'm gonna go ahead and press these and then I'm pretty much ready to put my bodice together. So I will see you on the other side. Okay, so I went ahead and put the bodice together. Excuse the lack of pressing, that will be done at some point. I just haven't done it yet. Um, I'm happy with how it turned out. I have to hold it closed at the back though, just because I haven't put in the back closure yet. I did put in the closures on the neck band. I ended up just putting in a couple hooks and eyes, so that should suffice. And I'm overall quite happy with how it turned out. I guess I could have added some boning in it just on those dart seams to kind of give the front a little more shape and to sort of prevent it from collapsing like it's doing right now but I didn't want the bodice to be too stiff. On the original, it was sort of very loose and flowy, so I wanted to keep as much of that natural shape as I could without putting in those bones. So yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and leave it. So next up is I have to start on the skirt. So that will be interesting because there's a lot of tool involved, but 
for now, I think I am happy with the bodice. All right. All right, I lied. Before I start on the skirt, I just wanted to show you the inside of the bodice and how I finished it. I felled the lining down and then I folded over the edges and felled those down. You can see right here all those tiny felling stitches. And then I ended up doing the same thing with the neckband. After I pleated it, I then felled it down into the lining of the neck strap, added in my hook and eye closures on either side. And then on the front, I just went ahead and prick stitched the front of the neckband all around the front just to keep that down. Prick stitches are nice. They're fairly invisible and tiny. You can see them when you're way up close, but when you pan out and go far away, you can't really see them as much. So prick stitches were used uh, very liberally on historical garments, especially from the 1780s and the early 1800s. Everything was just top stitch. They didn't give a flying you know what. So everything, everything is top stitched with prick stitches. So it's a really neat technique if you need to sew something on the front of a garment, but you don't want the stitches to be visible. Definitely use prick stitches. If you want me to do a tutorial on different kinds of stitches, I think I mentioned that already in this video, um, just let me know in the comments and at some point I can do that. All right, so now we're ready to move on to the skirt. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Brief change of plans. I decided to order some tool to make an underskirt with because I want my skirt to be as poofy as possible. And while silk taffeta does hold its shape really well, I thought a nice underskirt would support that even more and just give me the fluffiest, puffiest skirt I could possibly get. So here's my tool. Let's see what's inside. Okay, I'm a little concerned because I was told that this tool is 63 inches wide and that there were 11 yards of it, and yet this does not seem like a big enough package to contain all of that tool. Yeah, what do you think, Bonsai? Yeah, he doesn't know either. Okay, let's just go ahead and open it. Okay, um, I stand corrected. It is now the end of time and pink tool is all that has survived. It's the end of time and garbage is all that has survived. And it has taken over my bedroom and attempted to swallow my dog. Well, I guess it's time to make an underskirt. Now that I've gotten this tool somewhat under control, I am going to measure it out and cut my panels for the underskirt. So I want it to be about as wide as the tool, so it's going to be about 60 inches wide, and then I'm going to cut enough so that I have three layers of underskirt. Now I'm just attaching each skirt panel together with a running backstitch at the selvages, after which I will press them all open and then attach them all to the skirt with the gathering stitch. And voila, just like that, we have an underskirt. Time to move on to the overskirt. Same thing here, I'm just pinning the skirt panels together at the selvages, and then I will attach them with a running back stitch. Once the skirt panels are sewn together and the seams are pressed open, I'm just going to pleat both the front and the back so that it fits into my waist measurement. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'm just attaching the waistband to both the underskirt and the overskirt using a back stitch for strength because the waist seam has to take a lot of strain. Once the waistband is attached, all that's left to do on the skirt is to sew in the zipper and do the hemming at the bottom, and then we're ready to go ahead and attach the bodice. Now that the bodice is attached, I'm just giving everything one final good pressing. Well, what do you think? You look fabulous. Devastating. If we all wanted enough, it won't be the last. Okay, I just filmed this entire intro and didn't realize I had no mic on, so it's gonna be one of those days. Hello YouTube. No, what, what is that? Hello YouTube. Thank you for clicking on this video and thank you to Big Dad. Thank you? No, it was supposed to be shout out. Oh, oh my god, my hair is like, what is it doing? All right, it's story time. That's right. No, no battery? What are you talking about? Okay, like I can't charge my battery and pwn my blah, blah, blah. Ugh, I've done so many takes. And I just filmed that whole thing and my camera wasn't on, so we're winning today, guys. I can't I gotta do something about this baby hair. I was just like, oh, what is going on here? Shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. That was too sexy. Or was it sexy? Eh, I was just trying, no, we're just, no. This is why you write a script. You write scripts so that you don't end up talking for three hours about nothing. I should really just deal with my eyelashes at some point. Oh God. Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video. Oh, oh my God. Filming is hard, you guys, okay? Can't really see the shoe. 
Got it? Okay. I can't stand up. <laughs> this is fine. It's fine. Maybe it just won't work. It's <laughs> no! <laughs>